inviting me in for those who organise this. Um, and it's great to have a day to look at the One Nation idea from a historical perspective, from a philosophical perspective, <coughs> from a policy perspective, in a critical way. Hopefully with critical friends, but in a critical way. I think it's particularly appropriate that we meet uh, the day after the funeral of Margaret Thatcher. Um, I actually bought The Road to Serfdom yesterday, so I realised I'd never read it, and I thought it's something that I should read, so I'm about to start reading that this weekend. I mean, I know personally that one of the main reasons that I'm in politics is because of Margaret Thatcher, because I was struck <coughs> as a young teenager by the passion and the conviction she brought to politics, by her ambition to change the country fundamentally, by her belief that ideas can be transformational, and by the breadth of the intellectual and organisational movement that she and her fellow travellers brought to bear in effecting that change. But I also knew that I have fundamentally different values to her, and that her project, striking and transformative as it was, was sort of transformative in the wrong way. Um, but what Thatcher spotted was the exhaustion of an old settlement. And what she offered in her famous paraphrasing of St. Francis of Assisi, as she stood on the steps of Downing Street, was harmony in place of discord, truth in place of error, faith in place of doubt, hope in place of despair. <coughs> of those four, I reckon she delivered one of them, um, <coughs> faith in place of doubt. But faith in a philosophy, economic liberalism combined with what you might call philosophical individualism, a philosophy that ultimately, I think, significantly damaged that country, and a faith that was shared by some and profoundly despised by many. But our moment, I think, is like the late 70s in one important way, because I firmly believe that this is a moment that will reward those who spot <coughs> the exhaustion of an old settlement, of a settlement that Thatcher herself initiated, and people have the courage to argue for big change. Now, I'm not naive about this. Uh, most people in the country are not worried about about tectonic shifts of the zeitgeist, that isn't a ridiculously mixed metaphor. <laughs> they want a job, they want more security, they want more money left over at the end of the week. They want prospects for their children and their children's children to improve. Nor am I naive enough to interpret the anti-politics mood of the country as a clear endorsement of any one particular bid for radical change. As in the late 70s, unhappiness with the settlement generates contest between different kinds of uh, alternative approaches. But I do believe that the One Nation approach being developed by Ed Miliband, being developed by, by us in the, the Labour Party, is a profound challenge to the settlement that took root in 1979. I believe that it can meet the challenge of generating the solidarity that countries need to weather the storm in tough times, and of building a different kind of economy, in particular in the future, that will provide more prosperity as well as security over the long term. And I think it points not just to a radically different kind of economy, but without getting sort of very fairy or pompous, a different way of living together, based on an ethic that is quite different from that of the post-79 period. So that's my preamble. What I want to do today is just in 10 minutes talk about five core ideas that I think underlie the One Nation idea. Ideas that I think are going to, <coughs> from looking at the agenda, come up again and again uh, in the rest of the day. The starting point for One Nation is a rejection of a country characterised by division. The belief that our economy, society, and politics are damaged by division, and that a country in which the interests of a few dominate the interests of the many is not just less socially united, but less economically successful and less self confident than it should be. And instead, to use Ed's language, we're looking for a country whose productivity, prosperity, whose common life is based on the many, not the few. It's a patriotic, progressive idea. A belief that our country can be at its best when it attacks division, attacks separation, attacks exclusion. Now, Ed's talked about the notion many times. Let me just say, say, say what I think the five core ideas, in my understanding, are. Each of which learns from the experience of Britain uh, in the post-79 era, but also from our own record in government uh, in the 1990s and noughties. The first element is a commitment to building a different kind of economy. We need to find a different way to grow, compete, and succeed. I've argued that this, we should call this a supply-side revolution from the left, a you know, sort of tipping of the hat to, to the Thatcher period. Why is it so important? <coughs> Firstly, because the neoliberal model established by Thatcher was not just a problem on traditional lefty grounds of solidarity and social justice. It was that too, of course. It was a problem because it didn't work in its own terms. It has not worked. We should have the confidence to call it for what it is. 
It, it doesn't work anymore. If it ever worked, it certainly doesn't work anymore. And while many of the aspects of what Thatcher's governments did were necessary correctives to what came before, and public ownership of late life industries, some aspects of industrial relations, the rules that were hardwired into economic policy did not bear the fruit that its advocates promised. That model was based on a central belief in deregulated markets, less government, reducing taxes on the well off, a promise that that would restore economic health, and the entrepreneurialism at the top would generate wealth that would trickle down to everyone else. But trickle down was always theoretically very heroic, it turned out to be empirically false. It just, it just didn't work. And by being excessively dependent on financial services, with inadequate regulation of those who provided financial services, this approach left Britain with a legacy, I think, of bad economic consequences. An industrial base that was too narrow, a skills gap in the middle of our working population, tax revenues that were too dependent on one sector. <coughs> Stuart Lansley showed that in, on each of the measures of growth, productivity, unemployment, and economic volatility, the period from 45 to 79 outperforms the period from 79 <coughs> to now on each of those measures. But there's a second reason, other than the failure of the old settlement that demands a new one, and that is that we need to find a model for how we pay our way in the world going forward. David Cameron and George Osborne like to revive the language of Tina, there is no alternative, to justify their commitment to austerity in tough times. In terms of competing internationally, I agree that there is no alternative. There is no alternative to competing on the basis of higher skill, higher productivity and higher wages. Given the extraordinarily rapid emergence of China, India, Africa and the world economy, there is just no route to econ economic success for our country, in my view, on the basis of a deregulatory race to the bottom approach. I think they're fundamentally wrong in a hard-headed way about the way that we can compete in the next 20, 30 years. And this bringing back to Britain is the key point for me on the economy. If we're to raise our game on the productivity front, we need to have a fundamentally different approach to wealth creation at home. We have to explicitly challenge the trickle-down approach and the view that goes with it that the only <coughs> real wealth creators in our country are those with the most wealth. Which, by the way, has a parallel mistake thinking that everyone with wealth is a wealth creator, which is not true. It is pro-wealth, not anti-wealth creation, to resist the view that wealth is generated by the few, not the many. And we need to build the capacity to generate wealth throughout our economy. And this is where the supply side revolution is so important in my view. It means working with employers to build a technical education and apprenticeship system that we can be proud of. It means reforming our banks and building new kinds of banks so that they can compete with each other to provide capital for innovation rather than seeing their roles to make profits for themselves through speculation. It means supporting our leading industry from advanced manufacturing to creative industries and business services that compete through building skills and hence earning potential all the way through the workforce. It means filling out the middle of the hourglass economy, not out of charitable motives or, or lefty goodwill, but out of a hard-headed realisation that we will not compete unless we do so. So that's the first core idea for me, a different kind of growth, a different kind of competitive strategy. But it ties into a second element, a determination to address inequality. In the 1980s, Britain was told not to be so squeamish about growing inequality. And on the left, there was a tendency to think for a time that taking steps to address inequality would question our commitment to being pro-business and our commitment to a thriving market economy. But we now know that inequality was a symptom of much deeper failure of this post-79 settlement. For one thing, growing inequality showed that trickle-down was just not working as it should. For the past 30 years, my favourite statistic, for the past 30 years, just under a quarter of every extra pound earned has gone into the pockets of the top 1%. Hmm. This scale of growing inequality, whatever else you might think of it, goes to the heart of the legitimacy of that post-79 settlement. Because that settlement promised that freeing up the top would ultimately be to the benefit of all, not just a few, and it wasn't. And what rising inequality revealed was that there is a crisis of wages in the post-79 settlement. So in the 30 years after 1978, households in the middle 10% of the income distribution captured about 6% of all income growth in Britain. The top 10% <coughs> captured over 30 times as much, nearly 40%. And the share of GDP going to wages has fallen by about 10% in the last 40 years. 
What are the consequences of that? Well, a number of consequences, but they ripple out way beyond the standard of living crisis that we see. Middle and lower income families responded by, to, to, to the promise of leaner earnings by taking out more debt. And government's role became more and more, under us as well as under the Tories, to support incomes at the bottom, whether you were out of work or in low paid work, to compensate for the failure of the labour market. And the combination of asset bubble at the top and over leveraging in the middle, as it were, contributed to the fragility of financial markets in the run up to the, 20, uh, to the 2008 crash. All these failures we have to learn from. Combating inequality, in my view, is not just about social justice. Of course it is, but it is also fundamentally about the stability and health of our economy. How do we combat it? Of course through redistribution. That's going to remain a key part of the armour of a progressive government. But it would be wrong and foolish to expect government to bear the whole burden of correcting gross and growing inequality simply through tax and spend. A one-nation approach to inequality looks to change the role of markets so that we get to a more equal distribution of economic power and rewards, even before government starts collecting taxes or paying out benefits. We want, think of it this way, we want an economy where greater equality is baked in more and less bolted on afterwards. And that won't be easy, nor can it be achieved in four or five years. But you can make a serious start. And it's why we're looking at policies on incentivising the living wage, supporting ways to enable companies to exercise stronger wage and bonus restraints at the top. And it's why we want a revolution in technical education in <coughs> schools, so that there are alternative routes to high earning potential other than the academic route. And it's why we've committed to a mansion tax to fund tax relief for low income earners. The third element of One Nation Made Up is an emphasis on responsibility. And of course, everyone supports responsibility. It's an apple pie virtue in some respects. But when politicians of the right talk about responsibility, they usually think of it as an expectation of those who, who rely on state support. That's what they mean by responsibility. But the One Nation view, I think, is different. The web of obligations and responsibility, in my view, extends throughout society, not just to the poorest, and not just in virtue of dependence on the benefit system. The One Nation view of responsibility, I think, is more demanding and consistent than the rights. As Ed has said repeatedly, responsibility begins with those who have the most and demands the highest standards of those with the most, to bear a greater share of the load when times are tough, and to bear responsibility for their actions, which affect the public interest. And responsibility should be at the heart of our welfare state. That's why Ed, John Crudders, Lee and Byrne, others in Labour have talked about ways in which we can strengthen the contributory principle in welfare. If you look across Europe at social democratic and Christian democratic welfare states, pioneered by some of the parties that we on the left admire the most, Contribution has been at the heart of welfare systems for decades, sitting alongside other core principles. And in my view, I haven't got time for birds now, one of the reasons, that, one of the paradoxes of welfare politics in Europe is that the means tested welfare states have been the most susceptible to cuts, whereas the universal and contributory welfare states have been more resilient. In my view, that's partly because of the legitimacy that the contributory principle gives to welfare states it makes it much more politically robust in tough times. The fourth core idea of our nation, often associated with blue labour, uh, tradition Morris Glassman and others have written a lot about, is protecting the elements of our common life. And this has different parts to it. It means partly protecting and building institutions and public spaces that bring people together across classes, across different ethnic groups and other divides. When the riots happened in Tottenham, just a couple of miles from where I live, in 2011, I was struck by how many, as many people were, by how communities who lived hundreds of yards from each other never had any point of contact with each other. That can't be right. Having parallel world, worlds coexisting in our cities in the same geographical area. We need to think how our approach to public spaces, to schools, to arts, culture policy, other public policies can start to address that. <coughs> it also, protecting our common life also means Labour politicians, hopefully all politicians, looking at our country with humility and asking what is it that people value and how can we protect it, rather than telling them what they should value? And it means finding ways to increase communities' ability to have more control over the places where they live and ways of life. And this idea of protecting common life, I think, is quite a challenge for Labour, not just for the superficial reason that it's traditionally associated with the Conservative Party. Philip Bourne has written a lot about this. 
But I think more deeply because it means that we have to be prepared to tolerate diversity if it reflects what people value. And I think that's quite a challenge for the Labour Party, but I think it's quite important that we make moves in that direction. The last core idea I want to talk about is to challenge the ethic of the post-79 settlement. In a way, it's the most nebulous part, but I also think it's the most challenging and most important. Margaret Thatcher famously said, economics is the method, the object is to change the soul. Well, I'm not sure souls can be changed by politicians, or maybe by anyone. But the rules that an economy operates under can be changed. And those rules are themselves based on norms and ethics. One nation, in my view, what one nation Labour is trying to do, is fight for a new consensus on a different set of norms and ethics underlying our political economy. So, for example, I think one nation embraces the importance of individual freedom, <coughs> but squarely rejects the idea that individualism pursued by each magically generates the interest of all. A one nation approach is not naive or utopian about difficult choices, but I think rejects a politics based on pitting one set of interests against another. And one nation challenges the idea that obligations to others are limited only to those on benefits, demands reciprocity more widely. I think we also reject the idea that the metric of public value is simply the market price of something. And we challenge the idea that the ethics on which our society works should be fundamentally different from the ethics on which our economy works, which I think is a hallmark of the post-79 settlement. So for me, they're the core ideas underlying one, the One Nation approach. <coughs> Let me just say one final set of remarks about how challenging an approach this is for the Labour Party in particular. Not that that's the only relevant constituency, but for me, that's the day-to-day -day constituency that I, I care a, a lot about. The most obvious challenge, of course, is on spending. But of course, using tax and spend policies wisely is going to continue to be a crucial part of what Labour does in government. But we all govern in tough times. The voters know that, and we know that. More fundamentally, though, a new settlement, and especially an economy based on growing from the middle out, will not be achieved by spending, but by rewriting the rules. It's a rules-based project. Spending will be part of it, but it's not fundamentally a, a, a more spending project. It's a social democratic ambition, but I think it's much more familiar to social democratic parties uh, in Western Europe than it has been to the Labour Party historically. But I think it's important that it becomes part of that tradition. Another challenge is that One Nation forces us to think about how we build new institutions in training, in the banking sector, at the local level, even within the Labour Party itself. Building new institutions between the market at one end and the central state at the other it's not easy, and again, it's not that familiar, I think, for, for at least the post-war Labour Party tradition. But it's crucial to making this possible, different kinds of institution within a more organised market economy. And lastly, it's challenging, I think, uh, One Nation is challenging, because it relies on restoring faith in politics. Ed Miliband always says that when he goes around the country, the biggest obstacle he faces, he thinks that we face, it's not when people say they don't like Labour, they don't like our past, they don't like him, whatever they might say. It's not that that depresses him most or that he feels is the biggest challenge. The thing that is most formidable is the view, you're all the same, and none of you can really change anything. And the, in my view, the belief that nothing can be changed is far more the enemy of the left than it is of the right. The right thrives on pessimism about the possibility of change. The left is starved of oxygen by that pessimism. And for me, both the starting point and the indispensable condition for making progress on my nation is to keep alive the idea that politics can transform lives to be better. I'll stop there. Thanks very much for your time.